I, as, as already said, uh, my name is Shakil Ramshu is not here. He was from the University of uh, Srinagar, Kulkat Liga. So today's concerns are regarding water, the rivers, for peace in South Asia. Uh, in 1960, under the aegis of the World Bank, India and Pakistan signed the Indus Water Treaty. Today is almost 60 years and it's been largely successful. Uh, there have been uh, very minor deviations uh, from the text or the essence of it. But there have been issues, let's say, between Bangladesh and India and some progress was made regarding the Tista Garage and the Faraka Garage. There are, they, there might be some issues on the Brahmaputra. And certainly, we need to focus on the western rivers, on, on the west of Pakistan, between Afghanistan and Pakistan, the Kabul River, the Kul River, the Ketu River, and small rivers. And as was discussed yesterday, it would be very, very appropriate if the World Bank were to take a lead in resolving this issue also. I just like to mention that within Pakistan, the water situation is becoming desperate. In 1951, as uh, Mr. Shankar Takake would tell you, the population of Pakistan was about 30 million people and the per capita availability of water was over 5,000 cubic meter per person, 1951. Today, it is 850 cubic meters with a population of 2000, uh, 207 million. This is critical. Uh, we shall be discussing it. But, as I said, today the issues are slightly different. We are going to talk about cross-border cross -border waters and the issues related there. So may I request uh, uh, Mr. Shafat Kakakhir to discuss Pakistan's water-related challenges. And that's it, I would like to, to thank uh, Dr. Masuma Hassan for including the topic of water resources in uh, this very important uh, conference uh, and for inviting me uh, to make some submissions on this um, issue. Yesterday, the chair, uh, who knows his water as well as uh, uh, anyone uh, warned me that I was uh, going to address a very vast subject. Uh, it is indeed a vast subject, uh, but I'll try to at least give you all a tour de horizon, a broad overview of the water issues, um, which I believe uh, is becoming an existential challenge for Pakistan. I think the way we handle or do not handle water is going to affect the very survival of this country, let alone its prosperity or socio-economic development. And um, so I would like to <coughs> tell you why I think uh, our water situation demands um, actions by our political uh, leadership and by all of us. Uh, the policy of uh, bitter and equivocation, the willful neglect, uh, and the absolutely indifferent attitude that we have demonstrated with our being this important resource without which no life can exist on this planet, uh, that must give way. Uh, the status quo is not tenable. And um, 
So, um, as far as our water resources are concerned, they have two special uh, dimensions. One is the external dimension, and the other is uh, of the transboundary. And the chair suggested that we discuss the question of South Asian rivers for peace. Uh, and the, uh, the, the second dimension is the internal or domestic. And uh, I personally feel that the internal or domestic dimension is by far more daunting and urgent. Uh, but the external dimension also warrants prudent and diligent handling. Uh, why is there an external dimension to our water issues? The external dimension comes from the fact that 80% of our surface water is supplied by the Indus River Basin, the only river basin of this country. Now, Afghanistan has access to five river basins, India, many more. We have only one. So Pakistan is truly a, a child of the Indus Basin, just like Egypt is inconceivable without the Nile. Now, the bulk of the Indus Basin's river originates or transit through India and Indian administered Jammu and Kashmir or Afghanistan. We are therefore a quintessentially transboundary river basin country, and in respect of the three western rivers allocated to Pakistan under the Indus Water Treaty, we are the lower riparian country. The situation with regard to the Kabul River is slightly, uh, slightly different. Now, you all know. Uh, what happened on the 1st of April 1948, when after the collapse of efforts by the senior officials of both countries to agree arrangements uh, for the sharing of, of the river waters, uh, the Indian state of uh, uh, Punjab unilaterally turned off the uh, waters of the eastern uh, rivers uh, whose uh, now, these rivers irrigated lands in Pakistan, areas that became Pakistan, but the headwaters were located on the Indian side of the uh, Red Cliff uh, line. Uh, the World Bank uh, brokered the Indus Water Treaty, which was signed by Jawaharlal Nehru and the Yu Khan in September 1960. Uh, that agreement ensures Pakistan's access uh, to the waters of the three western rivers, the Indus, Janab, and Jhelum, whose combined flows represent nearly 85% of all the water sets of the Indus uh, River Basin. Uh, however, the implementation of the Indus Water Treaty uh, has run into uh, difficulties. Uh, for the first 15 years, between 1960 and 64, 14 years, we had no problem. The civil works in Pakistan were being built uh, the way they were planned. Uh, we had an arrangement whereby India would continue to supply uh, to let the rivers flow uh, until the civil works uh, were completed. Uh, and um, but since uh, India started building the uh, uh, run of the river in this uh, uh, projects or uh, hydropower uh, projects, uh, so normally river disputes or disputes over shared rivers uh, arise when. Uh, one of the rebellions uh, interferes with the river. So now under the Indus Water Treaty, India is allowed unrestricted access to the three 
eastern rivers. It is also allowed uh, the three western rivers, uh, the Indus and uh, Chenab and Jhelum, are allocated to Pakistan, but with uh, significant uses allowed to India under very stringent conditions. They are allowed some drinking water uh, uh, and irrigation uh, of, uh, water and run of the river. Uh, run of the river projects which are given in great detail in the annexures of the uh, agreement. And the annexures are so elaborate that they make the Indus Water Treaty the largest or the longest uh, document on, on any subject between any two countries. Uh, now, uh, uh, India has been building and planning these uh, projects. Pakistan uh, feels insecure because although the Indian projects are in conformity with the Indus Water Treaty, uh, Pakistan's worry is that the cascades of projects, I mean, you are talking about 30 uh, projects on the Chenab. You are talking about several on the Jhelum and uh, on the Indus there aren't uh, so many. Uh, Pakistan's worry is that the uh, limited storage, which is only to run the turbines, the rivers, and to use uh, to restrict or release the water uh, to the detriment of, of Pakistan. We also feel that India is not adhering faithfully to the uh, Indus, Indus Water Treaty's rule book in terms of timely notification of the hydropower plants it intends to build and with the requisite level of technical detail. So we either come to know from uh, newspapers about the Indian uh, projects or we get details but they are incomplete which makes it very difficult for our commissioner to process uh, and to see uh, whether Pakistan can live with the new uh, projects. Uh, without waiting for a green light from Pakistan. Now, the Indus Water Treaty does not mention that, but it is implied when India is obliged to give a prior uh, notification of the project, the implication is that it should go ahead with the construction of the projects only after Pakistan gives this uh, clearance. So the main problems so far between India and Pakistan uh, relate entirely uh, 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 to the Indian projects on the uh, Western rivers and at the moment. Uh, so far we have major, four major problems. One was resolved bilaterally, Salal Lem, one had to be referred to the neutral expert, that is Maglehar. One went to the court of arbitration. And uh, another one on the Willowbarad, which is the source of the Jhelum, uh, has been stuck for 37 years, uh, in spite of several sessions uh, of secretary level talks and foreign secretary level talks. At the moment, again, the World Bank has been trying desperately to bring India and Pakistan on one page on how to resolve the uh, issues relating to the design of the Kishan Dandadeh. The Court of Arbitration allowed India to build uh, this dam but asked India to make some modifications in the design. And Pakistan has problems with the a uh, new uh, design of the Kishan Ganga, and there is a new uh, 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 dam on the Jhelama, I think, Ratle. Uh, those are now in a, in a stalemate because Pakistan wants a quota, court of arbitration, whereas India wants a neutral expert. Uh, there are very profound reasons for that. Uh, I don't have the time, but if you are interested in that, there is an excellent brief uh, with the Jinnah Institute Commission, and Ahmed Rafa Alam has done that, 
He's done a marvelous job. I don't necessarily agree with his conclusion, uh, which is to continue to insist on the uh, on our position. I would be a little more flexible, uh, provided we can make some other uh, improvements in the way the treaty is implemented, as well as India's willingness to go beyond the treaty, uh, which I will talk about now. As I mentioned, the main disputes are on the uh, Indian hydropower projects. But there are a number of issues, you know, uh, which the treaty does not mention. Because this treaty was negotiated in the 1950s, when international law was in its infancy. There was no international law. The first international legal document came the Helsinki Principles was in 1961, one year after. And the major convention on shared rivers uh, is the UN uh, Convention on Transboundary Watercourses, which is called the Watercourses Convention, 1997, 37 years after the end of the So what are the issues that are important but are not handled by the end of the First, there is the question of the care of the watershed of the rivers. Now, the watershed of all the rivers is in India, or Indian control. Now, the way you handle the watershed, whether you deforest or you don't, whether you uh, manage uh, uh, the headworks of the rivers well or you don't, affects the flows of the river. Uh, uh, and all. That is the number one issue that is missing from the Indus Water Treaty. The Indus Water Treaty also has some references to the quality of water, but it does not have elaborate provisions like the Convention has about ensuring pollution control in the rivers. My friend Shakir Rabe, uh, Shakir Romsho, who hasn't come, uh, gave an interview about the Jhelum is so polluted that even Kashmiris are reluctant to go for walks or boating in the Jhelum because it is full of all kinds of residue, agricultural, municipal, industrial, just like Pakistan. In India, all the SMEs particularly uh, freely throw out all the affluents into the nearest water force they can find, whether it's a river or whether it's a lake. Thirdly, is when the treaty was undergoing uh, the rigorous negotiations that it did. Uh, but climate change is going to profoundly impact. Uh, you will hear from uh, Tanish, who is an eminent expert on, on the Indus water, uh, the Indus Basin, that climate change is in fact water change because the one sector which will see the most dramatic manifestations of variability of climate is the water sector. In our part of the world, our water essentially comes from two sources, the melting of the ice and snow on the high altitude glaciers of the Himalayas, the Karakoram, and the Hindu Kush. And it's the timely melting of the snow and ice that feeds the rivers that constitute the Indus Basin. What supplements and sub, you know, replenishes the river flows are the twice yearly monsoons, uh, which bring rains. So you get the bulk the Indus Basin, more than any other river basin in the world, most of the rivers actually depend on snow melt and ice melt. But the extent to which the Indus is beholden and dependent on ice and snow melt is between 50 and 60 percent, which is uh, uh, higher than the world average of 35 to 45 percent. And you also get the monsoons. Now, both the glaciers which are called the water towers of South Asia, and the monsoons. Both of them are highly, acutely sensitive to climate change. 
and the phenomenon of warming because higher temperature will result initially in the kind of outburst lakes that you have the Atabad, the Atabad glacial um, outburst lake. And later when the mass of the glaciers is eroded, the glacier will no longer have the capacity to hold water, to serve as the tower, to release it in summer for replenishing your river system. So, uh, uh, Masuma asked me to, uh, to also handle uh, some of the references in Shakil Ramsho's uh, uh, abstract, which he sent in advance of this uh, meeting. The point that Shakil was made, because he's a cryosphere expert, and he's gone at length uh, to the variability of the glaciers. Now, you're talking about 20,000 glaciers in the Himalayas, in the Hindu Kush, and in the Karakorams. There is definitely a variability. Some glaciers have been receding more rapidly than others. But as a climate change student, that I am not bothered which glacier loses its mass in 20 years and which one in 40 years. We are talking about water. Uh, in, a, in a sort of longer term perspective, in a longer term perspective, the phenomenon of recession in all the 18 major glacial systems in the world, in addition to the Antarctic and the Arctic, the phenomenon is of recession and uh, the glaciers losing uh, that natural function of first receiving and storing and then releasing the waters to benefit humankind. Issues that were not anticipated because they were not understood. At the time, the eight, eight year long negotiations, basically the real negotiations were between 1952 and 1960. Um, the question of the environmental flows in the eastern rivers. If you see the Rawi, it's no more than a gutter because India has actually switched off and diverted the entire flows, even if those flows are not needed. In fact, Indians have saved so much water from the eastern rivers that they arranged this Indira Gandhi or this canal all the way to Rajasthan, turning the desert into absolutely, you know, Faisalabad like. Uh, like fields, uh, agricultural fields. Uh, the, uh, for your information, the Court of Arbitration in the Kishore Gingat, uh, in that case, uh, actually uh, put a lot of emphasis on environmental flows. So Pakistan has actually a strong case that can even take India uh, to, to, to the international uh, processes uh, for resuming the environmental flows. So, uh, basically the other issues uh, that, apart from the implementation of the treaty, there are two sections, uh, Article 6 talks about data. Unfortunately, the level of detail in Article 6 is very scant, is very limited. So it leaves the supplier of the data uh, to the sweet will of the supplier, which is mostly India because the watershed is managed by India. And the other is Article 7, which is future cooperation. Uh, the two countries, the two signatories, have never discussed future cooperation. They only discuss disputes. One of the uh, tragedies we have with Ambassador Koper and Aziz Khan and Mantubinsa, uh, the tragedy of India Pakistan relations is that we, if we do talk, we only talk with a view to resolving issues and not uh, uh, talking like normal neighbors, uh, which should be interested in peaceful, constructive, and cooperative relations. So uh, this is basically uh, uh, the other fact is that the now off now on bilateral dialogue process, uh, which has been more off more recently since the Bombay uh, problem 2008 uh, has included the Willard Bilateral, 
But the Vulnada Raj is not, does not cover the kind of spectrum of issues that I have listed before you. And actually, to tell you frankly, Pakistani engineers will also tell you that with some modification, Pakistan can live with the Vulnada uh, Daraj because it does actually make uh, the flows more reliable in the, uh, in the world of lake and the river flows of the Jhelum uh, will become more predictable. Uh, so we could, we could live with the Vula Barad, but the other issues require urgent uh, attention. Uh, what I would suggest right away, instead of waiting for the last uh, uh, minutes for the recommendations, that India and Pakistan do need to carry out a comprehensive water dialogue which should uh, discuss the small uh, improvements in the way the treaty is handled, but go beyond the endless water treaty. Uh, the larger question, because the Indian Basin has lost 70% of its water assets in the past half century. It is one of the most uh, uh, depleted basins uh, in the world because of a number of factors, population explosion and economic development uh, and mismanagement being the principal ones. So what is called for in the interest of South Asian peace, in the interest of good neighborly relations, is a faithful implementation in letter and spirit of the Indus Water Treaty and a willingness on the part of these two major powers of South Asia to sit around the table and discuss uh, this existential question uh, for the benefit of their people. Two main diplomats. No book on Pakistan's foreign policy. No description of Pakistan of ground relations ever makes a mention to the, of the fact that we are not only held together by geography and religion and culture, we are also, we also share as many as eight rivers. Among them, the Kabul River, which is the seventh largest tributary of the Indus West. The Indus Water Treaty took care of six. The Kabul River's flows were taken into calculation when the, uh, for the negotiations, uh, experts carried out two sets of 20-year calculations. So the Kabul River flows were taken into cognizance, but since there was no dispute, there was no problem. Now, uh, I mentioned that the Kabul River is a slightly different river, because while it emanates in India, it rises in Hindu Kush. It receives very substantial flows uh, from the Chitrayan base to Narva. Uh, and in fact, the ability of the Kabul River to meet the demands of 7 million uh, people in Afghanistan in, cap in the capital cities uh, of Kabul and Jalalabad and the towns in between is because of the flows of the Kunar. So Pakistan is in a way both a lower and upper rebellion. And um, uh, which gives you some, some advantage when the negotiations, if the negotiations uh, start with us uh, in right earnest, uh, the sooner uh, the better. Now, in addition to the Buddha, to the Kabul River, uh, there are at least two major rivers in Quran. Uh, and the Goma. Now, both these rivers and the smaller rivers that come from Paktia mostly into uh, the federally uh, administered territories are very substantial rivers. And you're talking about a highly impoverished region. So, and on the on one of the Goma zones, which you, uh, in your time, it was built, uh, is 1881 or 85 megawatts, if not more. No, but the, the power generation is just 17 megawatts, 
But yeah, uh, but the storage is about uh, just under a billion acre feet. Yeah, but the other one, I think the... Uh, 84 megawatts. Yeah, that is 84. So you are talking about still almost 100 megawatts of water of, of electricity and, and substantial irrigation uh, in an area which has always been neglected by Pakistan except to use as military uh, battlefronts for, for outside powers. Uh, <coughs> Now, what does, what does the Kabul River mean for Pakistan? The Kabul River means that the Peshawar Valley, uh, which is the only fertile uh, uh, place we have, gets its irrigation. Mostly from the Kabul River, but also from Swat. You also have Warsaw, the first hydropower station built by Pakistan. You know, Pakistan, uh, by the way, since we are talking about 70 years, we had a total power generation capacity of 1,000 megawatts in 1947. And the Wasak Dam was one of the first hydropower stations, which with expansion is capable of uh, almost 300 megawatts, but Shati was telling me that it has set it up. The dam has set it up, and unless we come up uh, with affordable uh, 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 kind of technologies and resources, uh, uh, 300 megawatt of electricity is at risk. Uh, now, but the more important thing is that when uh, the Kabul and uh, also joined up with the Swat, when they joined the Indus at Atak, how much water does it do they contribute? 18.4 million acre feet. So Afghanistan and KP are major water donors to Pakistan. And the, this donation is not acknowledged. And it is because of the Kabul River flows that KP does not use the 8 million acre feet that it is allowed under the 1991 Indus Accord. It uses no more than five, although it should, because there is potential for increasing irrigation and food production, food sufficiency in KP if the infrastructure is fixed. Sure. We would confirm or not uh, confirm that. Uh, but still, we again KP gifts from its own meager share of 8.4 million acres, it, uh, it returns almost four uh, to, uh, to the other provinces. So, uh, as far as Afghanistan is concerned now, we have problems, we have worries. Uh, because the uh, Kabul was allowed to flow into Pakistan without any hindrance or complication, we never bothered. But since 2003, uh, Pakistani senior officials, Wabda chairman, IRSA chairman, uh, and other uh, secretaries of the Ministry of Water and Power have been calling for a water sharing agreement with Afghanistan. Basically, Pakistan's agenda is very simple. Just like our agenda in the discussions with the Indians, um, the Indus Water Treaty was let the rivers flow normally and naturally as they are born as that. So what we want is our, uh, our uh, flows and because the end system cannot do without the 18.4 uh, million acre feet that the end receives at Atak. But Afghanistan has a legitimate right to use its water resources for irrigation, for power, for uh, others, uh, you know, drinking water and sanitation, as Afghanistan's population has access to the national grid for power. The same as sanitation, the same as irrigation. Afghanistan has more than 3,500 cubic meters per capita renewable water, and yet it is one of the most arid, the most underdeveloped. Uh, agricultural economies of the world. So what we need to do is 
Pakistan and Afghanistan need to sit together to discuss water issues, uh, preferably not in the framework of let the river flow, but developing and managing the rivers jointly for joint and common benefit of the people of the two countries. A very good beginning was made in 2013 when uh, the President of uh, Khan Ambassador in Islamabad, uh, Zakhenwal, when he was Finance Minister, he and Isaac Nar spoke about, uh, uh, about, in fact, reached an agreement in principle on the setting up of a 1200 to 1500 megawatt uh, massive power project on the Kunar. And they even talked about a Pakistan Afghan Joint Commission on the Kunar. Uh, river project, but nothing has happened. So, uh, in the meanwhile, what has happened is why 2003 and these repeated calls? Because in 2003, the officially uh, uh, financed uh, Institute of Policy uh, Research, Policy Study, what is it called, ITRI, carried a report that India was supporting a dozen of land projects, which would reduce the flows of the Kabul River into Pakistan. But there is no evidence for those projects. The only project that India has supported in Afghanistan is the Salma uh, Dam on the, uh, on the river shared with Iran, the Helmand River, uh, and uh, which is producing a lot of electricity. So basically, it is the, this is the transboundary uh, uh, dimension and the focus is or the need that I want to, the point I want to mention is Pakistan must persist in efforts, both with New Delhi and Kabul, to engage them in a comprehensive dialogue. But of course it has to put its own house in order. It has to prepare itself. I think our people basically hope that the World Bank will come into the picture. The World Bank, by the way, uh, had offered consultation that even organized a meeting in 2014 in Dubai, bringing the foreign office officials and water experts to discuss uh, water-related cooperation. And uh, from what I know from the World Bank officials, they are willing to facilitate a dialogue. There is no organization better qualified than the World Bank the World Bank is involved in at least two dozen international basins uh, throughout the world, including in the Nile Basin, in the Zambezi Basin, in the uh, uh, basin that is shared by China and East Asia uh, countries and, uh, and all that. So this is the external dimension. I, I mentioned the internal dimension has been no less important uh, what has happened? Five minutes. Yeah. I'm trying five minutes. Basically what has happened is we started journey as an independent country, as a water affluent. With, as Shafiq mentioned, more than 5,200 uh, cubic meters of renewable water per capita. We have come down to 800. 2010, it was 1,000. So we are already a water scarce country. We are not water stressed on the border or on the verge of water <coughs> scarcity. We are a water stressed country. According to the Washington based uh, World Resource Institute, WRI, which is very, very respected, uh, by 2014, Pakistan will be the most water scarce country in this region, South and West Asia, and the 24th most water stressed country in the world. And uh, there are actually a lot of studies which will give you the different dimensions of how, uh, why our water uh, misuse is as colossal as, as it is. But basically the first driver of water scarcity is population explosion. We started with 32 million people, we are now 207 million. So there is a five and a half, six times, six 
hundred times increase of the population. Therefore, correspondingly, we are at about one-sixth of where we were in 1947 in terms of freshwater resources. Secondly, economic development. There has been development. I mean, you are talking about three small textile mills in 1947. You are now talking about several hundred of those mills. Uh, and also, you have more affluent people who happen to be more wasteful in their use of, uh, uh, of water. Thirdly, and this is a function of the uh, population increase, Pakistan is uh, the most uh, rapidly urbanizing country uh, in South Asia, but the urbanization is irregular, it is chaotic, it is a total mess. So what is happening is our towns are becoming major, Cities are, cities are becoming meg, major mega cities with huge sprawling uh, uh, neighborhoods and which where the water management is much worse than in the cities. Uh, the other reason is the water infrastructure. Pakistan's water infrastructure underwent major uh, improvements and innovations. First, because of the Indus uh, Development Fund. The Indus Development Fund paid for the two largest uh, reservoirs in Manla and Karbala, which also produce more than 6,500 megawatts of, water, of electricity. And it uh, stores together with Chashma uh, the, uh, uh, the three storage uh, facilities, Karbala uh, and Manla and Chashma, basically give you 14.5 billion acre feet, which is enough for 30 days of water contingency. And just imagine for a moment those who criticize the endless water treaty. If India had allowed the rivers to flow uh, without any hindrance, you would have no water storage worth the name. So what we go through every year during the so-called lean months, you know, one of the strange phenomena of water in Pakistan is that all your water, 82% of your water, comes in four months. And it is needed 12 months. So it's like we used to complain, you know, we get a salary once a month, we spend 30 days. So basically, uh, 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 the infrastructure has not been managed. And one of the uh, reasons, one of the manifestations of that is that nearly half of all the 104 million acre feet of water uh, that is released to the canals get lost in transmission. And you make good that loss by groundwater. So the Endless Aquifer is one, is the second most depleted aquifers in the world, the first one being the Arabia. So what we need to basically do is have at least a national uh, water policy, a national agriculture policy, bring all the water related institutions, about half a dozen of them, which act in independent silos, bring them all together, bring some harmony between the federal and provincial governments, and manage the water problem. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ambassador Dr. Parker Pilsa. Uh, we next have a very distinguished academic, uh, Dr. Danish Mustafa from the King's College, Geography Department. Intrastate, within the state, the water issues actually deserve maybe more focus than those between the states. I think that's a very important point he has made. He's also uh, mentioned that uh, there are there's a demand by providing water, especially irrigation water and land and drinking water. The demand for social justice is so important. We have seen that those at the tail end are the people, the meek, the mild, the, uh, those people who don't have influence in the society. So they either get their water or they don't. I will take more time and I request Dr. Anish Mustafa for his views.
So the thing is that, uh, hello? I mean, I could start making stuff up, but I'd rather have those slides there. Are they there? Either on the way. Uh, let me kick off by, first of all, talking about climate change in the first instance. Typically, uh, in 1989, my former uh, advisor, uh, my, my PhD supervisor, he came across this four conceptual approaches to thinking about climate change in the Indus Basin. And he said that you could either think about climate change in the sense of that there are these really incredibly clever people at the Tyndale Center in uh, East Anglia, or there are really clever people in Boulder, Colorado, at National Center for Atmospheric Research. And they have these really big computers that come out with these results that say that after 50 years, you're all going to die of climate change. Bad things are going to happen because these big computer models say that bad things are going to happen. And then you turn around and you go out to rural Sindh, or you go out to mountainous Kashmir, and you tell people, you know what, guys? There are these really clever people who know about climate change, and they're all white people, and they're telling you that you're going to be in serious trouble. Should you buy it? No. Turns out that people don't buy it. I have a sort of an interesting distinction of being a both an insider and an outsider, because when I am in Pakistan, yes, I'm an internationally based academic, but when I come here, Secretary Sahib is sitting there, the donors are sitting over there, they're saying, hey, we are very worried about climate change, you should adapt, you should mitigate. And the Secretary Sahib is, yes, 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 I'm very worried about it myself. When are you sending me to London? Or when do I get to go to Washington? Or whatever it is that we're going. And as soon as the delegation leaves, the person turns around to me and says, hey, yeah, what are these people on, by the way? <coughs> and whatever they are on, why aren't they sharing? Haven't they looked around what is going on in this country? Do they know the level of hunger, deprivation, injustice, and the problems that we have here and now? Perhaps it might be more useful that if you're thinking about climate change, to think about present vulnerabilities that are here and now. We're not starting from some sort of a adapted present, and the future is going to be a problem. Rather, the present is very much a problematic situation. So, Another way of thinking about climate change is no matter what happens, countries with the resources, countries with the technological or, uh, or technical know-how, if you will, countries with more democratic polities, if you will, are going to be better off than countries like ours. Perhaps the challenge is to address the vulnerabilities of here and now in order to address the uncertainties of climate change into the future. Now ask any climate scientist, you never get a straight answer. You say, is it going to be a hotter in Karachi? Is it going to be colder in Karachi? Is it going to be more rain or less rain? They're like, we don't know. Well, I believe in climate change. I know the science. I was a climatologist once upon a time, so I know that. And one thing I can promise you, that whatever it is that you do, whatever it is that you do, in the future, all the average conditions are not going to hold. That's the promise of climate change. And with that particular promise, I can tell you that there's a fundamental structural flaw in thinking about water contemporaneously, not just in South Asia, in Pakistan in particular, and in South Asia in general. The entire water management paradigm is predicated upon averages. When I came in as a lecturer at King's College, my head of department said that you need to teach multivariate statistics. But I knew a little bit about uh, multivariate statistics, but not enough to teach it. So when you don't know, you're not too comfortable about something and you have to teach it, you doubly work hard and can we get my presentation, please? <laughs> yeah, it was there, I can give it to you on my, on my phone, here. So, no, it's not really making it out. <clears throat> anyway, what was I saying? Ah, yes, so as I was teaching that particular module, it turned out that it's sort of a penny drop that average is a predictive model of the data. You look at an array of numbers and you say that if the number average falls within a particular set of specifications. If climate change is telling you that your averages are not going to hold, 
and your entire planning paradigm is predicated upon averages, do you know what you're doing? You're putting yourself in very serious trouble. Now that would have been quite okay, that would have been quite okay if climate change was the only issue. If you actually look at the variations of water regime in Pakistan, and you look at the crop water requirements, average is the worst possible number you can come up with. It is the most useless number you can come up with. It doesn't mean anything at all, functionally. But turns out, your, uh, your uh, interprovincial water record is predicated upon averages. Your Indus Water Treaty, I think I don't think it mentions actually volumetric flows. In the but practically every operational uh, protocol is predicated upon averages. So the problem is a structural one. Okay. So now when you move on from there about climate change, then there's a third aspect that I'd like you to consider about present problems. The third aspect is that when one says that climate change is perhaps, if someone says that climate change, you worry it. Someone says that because we are not good Muslims. <laughs> or, because, or because we are not good people. But I would argue, is it not because of that? Because you see, every society, every society has a moral gyroscope as an ethical gyroscope. The ethical gyroscope is derived experientially, culturally, scientifically, rationally, religiously, spiritually, you make your way. And almost every gyroscope is a hybrid. It is never purely religiously derived, it's never scientifically derived, it's a hybrid. Ultimately, if you say, why is climate change happening? Is it not about because we treat other human beings badly? Is it not about our hubris vis-a-vis -vis the non-human world? Is it not about the avarice? These are religious words. These are religious words that have a resonance within a particular moral universe. But is that moral universe irrelevant to the question of climate change? I presentation, I was asking for a long time. When the foreign policy morality or ethics is not a feeling. Because the other model, when one is talking about the International Register of Water, is essentially Hans J. Morgan Krauss International Relations Textbook. Those of you who are in the Foreign Service and the Foreign Relations, uh, you know that is the Bible of how international relations are taught across the world. Every nation for itself, a set of amoral black boxes engaged in a conversation with each other with no moral or ethical restraint whatsoever. That amorality of the conversation allows you to talk about nuclear weapons, just like you have to read that thing about that. It's not a bad thing. It's not a moral issue. If you moral issue, you are actually talking about a weapon of mass murder of humanity, regardless in their hands or your hands, the conversation becomes different. However, when you are talking about water, for example, it is precisely that amorality of the conversation between Pakistan and India which comes, comes into play. Right? There are multiple values of water. I used to work in uh, the Khana Union Council by the Ravi uh, in Tessil, uh, in uh, district. It was right next to Shorpur. Bhav, <coughs> if you want to... I think people have lost interest in what I'm saying. So. <laughs> well, people need, people, need, people need tea and I need water. Uh, the key predictive model is uh, averages that I've just talked about. The other thing is the key conceptual model for interstate water is that of new realist international relations relation, which is essentially saying that the amoral, rational conversation okay, between the states and that's what's going to be the arbiter. Okay? So, major jo, uh, South Asian policy discourse, how do we talk, what is the structure of thinking in the South Asian policy discourse on water. In the first instance, water is a national resource to be managed at the national scale. That is the first article of faith. 
तो पानी के सितून जो है उनमें से पहला सितून ये है साउथ एशिया में कि वाटर इज अ नेशनल रिसोर्स टू बी मैनेज एट द नेशनल लेवल सेकंड वाटर इज अ नेशनल सिक्योरिटी कंसर्न ये दूसरा सितून ठीक है तीसरा बेटर द थर्ड इज वाटर इज एसेंशियल फॉर मॉडर्न स्टेट बिल्डिंग इट इज इंटेग्रल to construction of pakistan or india or anywhere else dams are the temples of modern india that is the unmitigated unquestioned faith that underlies our conversation about waters in south asia ab ye baat hum kisi ko batate nahi hai lekin ye chupa hua ek asal hai it means ki water is a conduit for hegemonic control where there is a conversation between nepal and india when there is a conversation between bangladesh and india and there is a conversation between pakistan and india simple example every time i go to uh, nepal and there are indian colleagues over there indians say ki ji you know you have such a wonderful hydrologic uh, gradient why don't you guys develop dams and send water to us nepali is just kind of uh, flip their eyes ha ha yeah you know we we'll do that we we'll do that here you know we kind of scoop the water what is the dam how do you make that happen When you take them aside and say, "Why are you doing this?" They say, "Yeah, you know, but India has our roads on our necks all the way. If we were to build a dam and make that sort of a strategic dependence of India upon our resource, we are doubly screwed. We're not going to go there. We'd rather have no electricity in Nepal because the economics of dam building in Nepal for electricity supply don't work for the kind of population." So they know that. So they pretend to be doubly stupid in front of the Indians. Because even we have never heard that. Ha ha ha. That we and he can be up and down. So this is what happened. But at the same note, a paranoia is on part of Pakistan that they want to control the whole area without recognizing that the earlier three ideas that I suggested are also very much alike in Indian thinking as alike as they are in our thinking. And lastly, I would argue. the states are not black boxes in fact they are constituents especially in federal states like india and pakistan they are constituted by powerful sub state actors in case of pakistan punjab in case of the indus basin in india we are basically talking about punjab and haryana more so haryana uh, and punjab and certainly rajasthan and kashmir come into the conversation as well now i would argue that a lot of indian conversations with pakistan with regard to indus are in fact driven by the punjab haryana conflict over water and pakistan's conversations with india or posturing towards india are determined by the punjab's posturing or concerns about water that said i'd like to submit to you a few myths of transboundary water number 1 india deliberately floods pakistan agar aap kabhi punjab mein jaye to it is an article of faith ke ji flood kyun hai kyunki india ne pani choda theek hai ji anyone who knows first thing about dams knows that there is not a dam in the world that can hold back floods water of the monsoon duniya mein koi dam aaj tak bana nahi hai aise aapko pata hai ke the protocol of dam management in pakistan it can be confirmed कि 20 अगस्त को डैम फूल होना चाहिए अगर चीफ इंजीनियर साहब में सेक्रेटरी बन रहे हैं तो 20 अगस्त को डैम फूल नहीं है तो इज नॉट गोइंग टू बी अ सेक्रेटरी ठीक है जी 20 अगस्त को क्या होता है खास बात पाकिस्तान के अंदर ठीक 20 अगस्त इज लेट मॉर्निंग तो अगर फ्लड आ जाए और वहां पे भरा हुआ हो आपका रिजर्वर तो आई थिंक द थिंग्स आर नॉट गोइंग टू बी वेरी प्रेजेंट एंड दे वर्ड इन 1992 एंड दे ऑफन आर नॉट सेम थिंग हैपेंस इन इंडिया ठीक है जी पानी को छोड़ते हैं क्योंकि उनको भी डैम बनाने का उतना शौक है जितना हमें शौक है तो ज्यादा शौक है ऐसे ही नहीं तो वो जब डैम बनाएंगे उधर जब फ्लड आएगा तो जाहिर वो अगर डैम खोलेंगे नहीं तो डैम से फिर वो सारा पानी आपके सर पे आ गया ठीक है दूसरा इंडिया कैन स्टॉप पाकिस्तान वॉटर शेयर दिस इज प्रेडिकेटेड अपॉन ए सम वॉट मिसअंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ द मटीरियलिटी ऑफ वॉटर If you think about the groundwater surface water flows and how they behave you know that indus is a complex surface subsurface uh, water uh, flow system it is not a tapping system ye nahi ki aapke mande daade aapka pipe kaat ke aapko pani nahi milega 
interspaces is a lot more complex than an urban plumbing system. <coughs> Dominated by civil engineers. A Jawad army, civil engineering, karke nikalta hai, University of Engineering and Technology, se, ek bhai ko, and saying that there are multiple values of water. A productive value, bhi hai, economic livelihood, production value, bhi hai, material use value, bhi hai, you have needed to drink, you need to survive. It's not just for generating in work. A cultural value, bhi hai. Aap sindh ko sindh lala nahi keh sakte. Sindh is a river that has given its name to a religion called Hindu. Sindhu, Hindu hota hai. Person in the land of the Sindhu. It has given its name to a civilization, India, Indic civilization. Why those I think is one of the biggest injustices that Pandit Nehru did to South Asia was named India, India. Because we don't have to say India. Because we are part of that civilization. Spiritual, Abhay Zamzam, is integral to us. If you think about it. Water for ablutions, if you cannot offer your prayers, the fundamental tenet of the religion without any water. So there is an aspect of that. His identity, question of Sindhiness, question of Punjabiness, question of Sony Mahimal's land, these are important to the stories we tell about ourselves and how we survive. Symbolic so on. Next to our India the myth that Pakistan is concerned about water with regard to India are reasonable. That is that is a myth. Many of Pakistan's concerns vis-a-vis -vis Indian development are reasonable. But the, one of the most reasonable uh, problems we have is data sharing. India can the water data is classified. It is classified not to spite Pakistan, but because they don't want Punjabis and the Haryana Wallas to avoid each other's throats. And they don't want Rajasthan to invade Punjab. It's a very, very important divisive issue, subnational. So they keep it classified not for Pakistan, they keep it classified to keep their own generated units from going at each other's Surface water quantities, all that matters, are the 80 percent crop water requirements. So here repeatedly academic research we are water management by low spark of Sandikarte. Repeatedly academic the Sid Ati. Sid is the Apukhari. That's the issue. And lastly, a bad bad myth here is that we are going to be able to do it, and we are going to be able to do it, and we are going to be able to do it. Because the most important thing is that we have to do this that we don't like the rest of the things that we don't like. But we have to do this that we have to do this. No, because the vision, look, the vision is this, that our industrial development is like this, our institutions are like this, and our staff are like this. Look at that. Eventually, you can't do that. You can't do that outside. तो रही बात वो ये कि हमारी चीमानी हो, इंडस्ट्री चीमानी हो, इसलिए सब देखा गया हो, पर सकारात्मक हो गया है। चलिए थोड़ी ये सांग। मैं ये कहने की कोशिश कर रहा हूँ कि इकोलॉजी is integral to the lives and livelihoods of the poorest of the poor in this country, which despite the middle classization of this society, continue to be, I would argue, functionally 70 percent of the population. गरीब आदमी को जब पानी चाहिए होता है तो वो टूटी नहीं खोल सकता वो चश्मे से लेके आता है। गरीब आदमी को जब अपना खाना चाहिए होता है तो वो बाहर जाके काश करता है अपना मिट्टी से अपना हवा से हरे चीजें उसको इस्तेमाल करते हैं। इकोलॉजी की बात आप छोड़िए। इकोलॉजी के बगैर गरीब आदमी Otherwise, I'll stop it. On the Kala Dog Dam issue, I'd like some comments on that, how that interstate within us. Uh, the other, uh, I hope that you can answer also on the idea of providing water resources through desalination. I think most of the people don't here recognize that this is the white elephant in the room uh, that we are not talking about. Because without air and then without water, there is no life. So, okay. uh, you spoke about... <coughs>
is that we use our water productively, the more crop per drop. But uh, the, 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 the other question is not the nation. Uh, China you know, uh, okay, desalinization, uh, every day it's getting cheaper and cheaper. And uh, for example, in, in Lower Sen, near the Manchat Lake, Wagda had constructed uh, some projects uh, for the Manchat Lake fishermen. It is still expensive, but there is a project under which, you know, the right bank outfall drain and the left bank outfall drain, you are aware of that that take the saline water into the sea, there is a proposal to desalinate that water and if, you, if that can be done, sin gets an additional 2 million acre feet of water but that's under the itself. Yes, yes sir. Yes, uh, uh, sorry sir, after that sir, it's you. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I gender and environment because I teach a course myself on the international politics of the environment and I'm very interested in what morality encompasses these discourses and what is the correlationship between military patriarchy, gender and environmental degradation. Dekhi ji, uh, I think it's super okay. If I think that if you were to short circuit the process and you say what is what should be the fundamental value in water management? If you were to concede KG it is economic productivity, then a different set of things have to happen, and those are the sorts of things that, that are happening. You can come up with whatever uh, characters you want to come up with, you can come up with the military, you can come up with the business elites, you can come up with the patriarchy, you can do that. But if you say a social justice ought to be the core value. Now, social justice ke andar, uh, women is a part of it, social justice ke andar, minorities are a part of it, social justice ke andar, the poor are a part of it. If that becomes the core value, then a fundamentally different set of uh, uh, solutions will suggest themselves. So, answer, and a different set of parameters around which you have a conversation with India. Now, the problem is that India ke bhi jo parameters are not the same as the people who are not the same as the people who are not the same और उसी सोच के दायरे के अंदर बहस चलती है फिर हम आपकी नहीं मानते हम आपकी नहीं मानते आप खराब आप खराब एक दूसरे को बुरा भला के स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ थिंकिंग जो है ना जी मेन चीज होती है स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ थिंकिंग आप न्यूक्लियर ले लीजिए आप जियोपॉलिटिकल ले लीजिए आप कुछ भी ले वाटर ले लीजिए इफ द स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ थिंकिंग यू रिफ्यूज टू ब्रेक आउट ऑफ दैट स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ थिंकिंग बाय द वे यू व्हिच यू हैव व्हिच इज अ पोस्ट कॉलोनियल स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ थिंकिंग then of course you're going to have the sort of conversations and the sort of posturing and the sort of things that, that you see. But if you change the structure of thinking, presumably something else will happen. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, man. Uh, no, clarification. We're talking about class boundary. Yes, sir. And there you said that there are 32 million people with 5,000 cubic uh, meters being available to each. And now there are 207 million with the availability of being As far as I can see, it seems that the water has increased rather than increased. So that's because the storage is there. I, I, I understand that, but what I'm saying is that... Yeah, yeah. No, what I'm saying is that transboundary, there has not been any diminution in the amount of water available. Is that correct or not? So, I mean, uh, if, if, these, if these figures are correct, that you're talking about 15 billion uh, cubic meters in one case and about 17 billion cubic meters in the other case, which, as you said, is partly owed to the fact that you have stories. But uh, my point is that the trans boundary, uh, cross uh, boundary, you have no problem. Your problems are essentially internal and the distribution, where now I understand that you have 91% use in agriculture and about 9 to 10 percent for uh, urban consumption or other uses including uh, industry. I wish that was the case. I wish that was the case. What is happening in Pakistan is 
drawing 64 million acre feet of water from the ground, rapidly depleting our aquifer, which makes the, as I mentioned, the Indus aquifer the second most depleted aquifer on this planet. And the first one is just under the Rum el Khali, the empty water in the Arabian. Arabian uh, so there is a drop of water. Basically, as I mentioned, I mean, you release 104 million acre feet to the canal system. Because of the uh, silting, you know, the South Asian water courses silt more than anybody else because the Himalayas are the youngest mountain system. So they generate more dust and more part particular rains. So the, the silting is much more rapid than anywhere else in the world. But what we are trying basically, you know, until 1960, the average withdrawal of groundwater was 3.4 million acre feet. It is now 64 million acre feet. So we've made good the loss uh, of water by over abstracting the groundwater. Sir, my question is dedicated to you, Mr. Kakhil. Sir, you have overruled India and decided in our favor. Plus, as has been pointed out, for the first time, you know, uh, it spoke of the environmental flows in Gurel, uh, where the Kishanganga River, uh, called the Neelam River, when it enters Azad Kashmir, the International Court said half the waters in the four dry months would be shared. So that was a tremendous victory for Pakistan. Sir, my last question is just... Uh, uh, could we uh, just ask... Last you heard the World Bank uh, uh, officials speak about that yesterday. Uh, because there is a problem. There is a proposal for a 1200 megawatt uh, hydropower uh, project in on the Kurnar River. Uh, but there is nothing, no further developments. But I would just like to re-emphasize what Dr. Danish said, what uh, Shabkat uh, Kakakir said, and what uh, Najwani said. You know, it is the water within the country which is our most serious problem. We have to focus on our waters within the country. We are wasting them. You know, nowhere in the world do you grow sugar cane by bringing water a thousand kilometers to conduits. How can sugar cane is a uh, is a delta crop dependent upon rain? Yes, you can never uh, uh, do that. You know, this water is so expensive. Each time you export a a kilo of basmati rice to uh, the Middle East, it costs you 15,000 liters in water. So, you know, you have to take a whole view of it. But one issue uh, which I would like to flag and I uh, then ask uh, Dr. Danish to wind it up, is that water is not being costed in Pakistan. Water is free. And the influential people, and he was talking of uh, even social justice, if you were to pump water uh, using diesel or uh, whatever you're using, not electricity, but electricity people don't pay the bill, it costs you 4,000 rupees an acre to provide for water that you extract through cubits. But if you take the same amount of water through the common canals, you pay nothing. The Abhyana is 150 rupees uh, uh, for two seasons. And yet, the recovery of Afghana in Pakistan is barely about 60%. So this is a very unfair, uh, uh, very unjust system, and you have to address it. But I have no doubts that it's the internal policies uh, which are more important, because as was pointed out, you know, in the last uh, 57 years, there have been no major violations or infringements as far as the water treaties are concerned. But uh, as far as we are self concerned, you know, the, those people who are not very friendly to Pakistan have been pointing out repeatedly, I have heard it myself, that 31 million acre feet of water goes into the Arabian Sea. Maybe it's not 31 million acre feet now, it is about 22 million acre feet. But 22 million acre feet of water going into the Arabian Sea, uh, you know, you have to provide 8 to 10 million acre feet for uh, environmental flows so that the sea intrusion is checked. But otherwise, uh, we have been wasting water. So, uh, just one final... 
Amongst other things, it allows run of the uh, run of the river projects, dams in uh, Indian occupied Kashmir, and India is exploiting this provision to the hilt. And I think this provision is more dangerous for Pakistan than the nuclear bomb. Do you think something can be done about this uh, exploitation of the run of the river provision? Sir, so I think we will have to go to the specifics. In the case of Kishan Ganga, there were arguments that Pakistan put forward at the Hague were largely accepted. Uh, in other cases, but generally, you know, there have been no uh, stoppages of waters. So the uh, the treaty has been holding on well despite all. Actually, uh, just a uh, uh, quick point. Uh, in 1984 to 1987, there was an insurgency in Indian Punjab in which 45,000 Indian citizens were killed by Indian security forces. Most people know that. One of the big issues in that insurgency was the Punjab Haryana water distribution uh, situation. Today, I have worked the length and breadth of this country, talked to all sorts of stakeholders about water distribution. And one of the things that often comes up is, ki in Pakistan, Punjab's interest is Pakistan's interest. KP's interest is KP's interest, Sindh's interest is Sindh's interest, and Balochistan's interest is Balochistan's interest. This situation is in particular. I'm not suggesting that Sindh is right and Punjab is wrong, or who's right and who's wrong. I don't want to get into that debate. What I, what I want to point out is that the situation out there, in the world out there, there are unscrupulous elements everywhere, where water is indeed implicated with questions of identity, with questions of livelihood, and he said to me, Baba, this is a Kalabagh Dam, or in Sindh, there is a Kalabagh Dam on every Kalabagh Dam. But that's not the point. The point is that as a, as a, as a, as a matter of political and cultural discourse, we have to be very alive to this particular problem. Second thing, very importantly, as you have said, Pakistan is the largest exporter of groundwater based water in the world. Number one is Pakistan, number two is United States. This is 2017 Nature magazine, the top scientific magazine. I'd be happy to share with you. I put it in the record, that particular journal article. And you can share that we are the largest export. Uske baad aapke ke paani nahi hai, aapke paas to mehni maan. Nothing. I thought that in this room over the past two days, I've seen quality experience worth at least a couple of thousand years and it would be uh, sad if the recommendations and the suggestions made let's say about water if they are not put to any uh, beneficial effect of the society uh, you know we would print a report and then that's going to gather dust in various archives and government departments cupboards could i request you uh, dr saiba that you need a, a small team of four or five distinguished people and call on the Prime Minister and call on the Chief Minister and tell them that this is what is required as far as water is concerned. Water in Pakistan is really the population growth problem. And we are more or less uh, failing as far as the, growth, uh, the rate of growth of uh, population is concerned. And uh, what you were saying, uh, if the amount of water per capita is falling is because of this excessive growth rate. So I would really request that, uh, that once the reports and the suggestions are finalized, maybe you could meet with the Prime Minister or some ministers or the concerned people, provincial governments in particular, and uh, make them aware of the issues at hand. Uh, I thank uh, uh, Shafkat Kakir sir, I thank uh, Dr. Dhani sir, I thank all of you. Uh, we had uh, we were pressed for time, but we pushed things up, and thanks a lot. Going to be led by Ambassador Riaz Koker. I'm extremely grateful that he has uh, traveled to 
Karachi from Islamabad, although he is a very busy man, he's got so many things on his hands, so many projects, so many lectures, so many universities to address. Uh, this is going to be a round table uh, session and uh, some of our participants who have come from abroad, uh, including and, uh, two members of our Editorial Advisory Board of Pakistan Horizon will also speak, but Riyaz yeah. Saab is going to lead the discussion. This is on settling interstate disputes. It is really the ultimate, the penultimate session of this conference. And uh, Riyaz Saab is one of the most distinguished uh, diplomats that Pakistan has ever had. He has been our ambassador in many, many countries, including the United States of America, and also in uh, our High Commissioner in India. Uh, where I had the privilege of seeing him and uh, seeing him operate uh, so magnificently. I, I invite you, I invite you, Riaz, to please lead this discussion. Uh, many of my colleagues uh, also, I know, uh, would uh, endorse what I am saying. Um, the, the, the topic uh, uh, that we are supposed to cover, uh, my, my remarks will really relate to the security environment in, uh, in, in South Asia and uh, conflict uh, management or crisis management um, and how, uh, how we have to look at it. But before we talk about the, 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 the situation in South Asia, uh, we, cannot, we cannot have uh, foreign policy and security issues in isolation. Uh, we have to look at the uh, security and environment uh, globally and of course regionally. And of course we cannot ignore uh, the, the, the situation in the country itself. Um, Pakistan, if you, no matter which capital you are looking from uh, abroad, uh, uh, Pakistan is seen as a country that is uh, uh, at the moment going through a very difficult period. It's kind of politically fractured. Uh, in, uh, there's a kind of a, sort of a political stalemate going on at the moment. Um, economically, we have some difficulties. Uh, which have now even been identified by the World Bank, uh, and uh, and militarily we are stretched. Uh, apart from that, of course, uh, many distinguished speakers here have referred to many other problems that Pakistan is facing. Uh, not only the water issue, population explosion. I think uh, all of us should really be worried by the figures that have come out now: 207 million or 210 million. Um, and uh, the issue of terrorism uh, that's haunting uh, Pakistan and of course the neighboring countries, uh, the issue of uh, uh, cross-border activity, uh, and of course the sharp deterioration in the relationship, uh, 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 Pakistan relationship in, in the region. Um, well. To begin with, uh, I think uh, the international situation itself is is in disarray and, and in a, and a, and a state of flux. Uh, if you just look around and see what's happening in Asia, and most of the problems really, all the hotspots are in Asia. We currently have this uh, situation in North, uh, North Korea and the United States, or the nuclear uh, program of North Korea. We, nobody knows which way the cat's going to jump. It seems that uh, there are two uh, gentlemen who, uh, well, I don't know whether it would be fair to call them deranged, but they are very close to it. But, I mean, the thought of a nuclear war in, uh, in, in Asia is just uh, mind-boggling. Mind um, there is also a lot of talk about a great game in Asia um, involving the United States, uh, China, and, and, and of course Russia. Uh, clearly, uh, the, there is no doubt that China has, uh, is rising, has risen, and is, is constantly rising. And, and eventually, 
clearly the, all the indications are that it will become uh, a major, major power. Uh, and the United States feels that its domination or its uh, dominance in, in world affairs is under challenge. Clearly, the United States is not ready for this, uh, is not ready to give up. Uh, and also, uh, United States uh, behavior in the last two decades alone would show that it has been, uh, it has not uh, been shy of taking unilateral action wherever it, it was necessary. Um, China is rising, R Russia has uh, is, is shown resurgence. So clearly, uh, there is a kind of a 2020 match going to go on in, 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 in Asia, where, um, where uh, clearly the countries in Asia will also be, you know, will be conditioned by what is what kind of relationships develop between these three three uh, three countries, and how they factor in uh, what's happening uh, in, in 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 South Asia. Um, it's not only North Korea. There's, there's the issue of South China Sea. There is the, there is talk about uh, of uh, America strengthening its uh, alliances uh, in order to in order to pressurize pressurize China basically. And there's talk about containment of China. There's talk about containment of Russia. There's talk about containment of Iran. Perhaps containment of Pakistan. Uh, and and uh, and clearly. Uh, uh, I think uh, my friend Javed Jabbar uh, sort of mentioned about containment of President Trump. Uh, so um, I, I think we have a we have a rather comp complicated security environment. On the other side, if you look at the Middle East, uh, Middle East is devastated. Uh, look at the, the situation in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya. And now, and, and, and Yemen, and, and now, of course, uh, the, the situation in Saudi Arabia itself is, is a matter of concern for uh, uh, certainly the Islamic world. So Islamic world itself is in disarray. Uh, so all these things uh, are beginning to impact in, in, uh, in, in our region. Uh, another factor which is very worrisome and of course uh, a lot of Western commentators talk about it is the, the sort of a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and, and Iran and, and how this will play out for not only the Middle East but also for the adjacent regions. Um, our own region, uh, uh, South Asia, which is host to 1.6 billion people, uh, one of the poorest uh, re regions in the world, uh, one of the worst interconnected regions in the world, and uh, and, uh, and highly militarized. Um, the, not only militarized, but in, uh, both countries are Pakistan and India are nuclear countries. So I think anybody who thinks in terms of war uh, in South Asia, uh, I think uh, really. Uh, is something very worrisome. Uh, war is not an option for India or for Pakistan uh, because uh, clearly this is something that can escalate into a very dangerous situation. And I think my my good friend Ambassador Munir Akram seems to have talked about it at great length. So war is not an option for India and Pakistan, but clearly the situation at the moment is not only dangerous but it is perilous. India, Pakistan, and the situation on the border. Uh, uh, the, uh, the situation on the LOC uh, is very grim. Uh, in fact, uh, it has now become routine that every day uh, either the Pakistan High Commissioner in Delhi or the Pakistan or oh, the Indian High Commissioner in, in Islamabad are being called for, uh, for protests. So this has become routine. Uh, and, uh, and on our side, uh, clearly we we, there, is a, there is a level of concern in, in, in Islamabad. Where is this heading? Um, the 1,300 or 1,400 violations in the last 10 months, which is very, very serious. And uh, uh, what is also happening is that India is now using, uh, instead of light weapons, they are using uh, heavier weapons, which, is, uh, which can uh, escalate into a very dangerous situation. As far as the dialogue between India and Pakistan is concerned, quite frankly, uh, it hasn't really made any progress. 
In fact, since Bombay, I would say since 2008, uh, things have not really moved. And even if there have been talks from time to time, they've really been about talks for talks. But uh, no progress has been made, and since 2014, uh, in fact, there has been really a freeze. Uh, and the freeze basically is because we, of course, focus on Kashmir uh, uh, as a dispute. We focus on Siachen and Sintri as the other disputes. Then there are issues uh, of, of concern and terrorism, of course. India, India uh, is emphasizing that this is the only issue between India and Pakistan. And if terrorism is taken care of, uh, the problem will be resolved. Uh, Kashmir is not an issue for them. They say that uh, from their viewpoint it's more or less settled. Uh, and the situation inside Kashmir is extremely grim. Uh, so many people have been killed. Uh, so many people have been maimed. Uh, and uh, sadly, the international community is really taking no notes of, 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 of that. Uh, well, there's no, such, there's no such thing as morality. Uh, even the United States, if you see, uh, with all the emphasis that it is placing on its South Asia policy, did not, President Trump did not even refer to Kashmir once. Neither have his uh, other principals, the Secretary of State uh, or the uh, Secretary of Defense, made any serious references to the sharp deterioration of relations between India and Pakistan. Pakistan also, of course, on the other side, you see the security situation uh, is, is getting worse by the day uh, in, in the context of Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan's uh, situation is very grim. Uh, there seems to be no uh, end to violence. Uh, and uh, uh, it's clear that the Afghan government uh, is not in a position really to bring about some kind of a solution internally. We have to recognize the fact that the Taliban are a reality, whether we like them or not. They are a major player in, in, in Afghanistan. And, uh, and, uh, and President, President uh, Trump's emphasis uh, on taking a, a kind of a military course in Afghanistan uh, really actually uh, seems that uh, we are in for more trouble in the region. Um, uh, it, it's a policy that has uh, not succeeded in the past, even when there are 100, 100, more than 100,000 troops. It, it has uh, shown no violence, has, uh, has in fact increased. Uh, the Afghan government uh, is dysfunctional. Uh, its forces are not up to speed. So clearly, all the signs are that it's uh, not going to be uh, a very happy situation. So Pakistan, as you can see, is in a bit of a nutcracker. Uh, and uh, Pakistan is also uh, concerned, very seriously concerned, about India's uh, role in Afghanistan. Uh, now that uh, President Trump seems to be giving India a sort of a free hand, that would cause uh, even even greater problems for Pakistan. Uh, th thirdly, of course, India, India's uh, involvement also in the internal situation in Pakistan. Only yesterday, the chief of uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, Committee made a, a speech somewhere in Karachi, where he talked about the heavy involvement of uh, of India in the domestic uh, situation of Pakistan, and particularly on Balochistan. Uh, and one can see that recently uh, uh, some awful incidents have, have taken place. Now the question is, uh, where, where do we go? How do we manage? Uh, Kashmir, I think, uh, to, be, to be fair, the, uh, this, is a, this is a dispute that was under huge focus in the 50s. I mean, if you look up the records, you will find uh, that uh, not only was the United Nations involved heavily, but a lot of uh, uh, discussion and talks took place, but of course at the end uh, there was really no uh, resolution. And that is because of uh, the, uh, the sort of uh, intransigence of the Indian leadership. But the interesting part is in the 50s, uh, there was a lot of contact among uh, our leadership, the, the leadership uh, on, on the two sides. 
Uh, you can see uh, records of uh, letters being exchanged, uh, conversations taking place, meeting taking places, and you know, uh, I mean, you visited uh, uh, India. Jawaharlal Nehru came here a couple of times. So contacts in the 50s were were really, uh, uh, I would say, compared to the current situation, impressive. Uh, then, of course, we know that uh, in, in the 60s um, uh, there were discussions between uh, uh, Foreign Minister Bhutto and Foreign Minister Swarna Singh. Uh, those were actually uh, helped, uh, facilitated by the, by the United States and Britain. But again, uh, it was uh, in the ultimate analysis, it was love or we never got very far. The third phase is, uh, is uh, the, uh, the, the sort of during, uh, during President Musharraf's time, uh, there was a dialogue uh, between India and Pakistan on the, on, uh, on the back uh, channel. Uh, my, one of my successors, uh, Mr. Riyal Mohammed Khan, a very, very distinguished uh, colleague and uh, diplomat, he was uh, heavily involved. He seems to uh, maintain that uh, a, a considerable progress was made between India and Pakistan. Uh, and if uh, the if uh, President Musharraf had not uh, left, uh, things uh, would have happened. But uh, I certainly am not of the same opinion. I, I don't don't think uh, uh, the, the four point uh, formula of President Musharraf was uh, the real answer. But there are now people who think that uh, if at all talks uh, ever take place between India and Pakistan, that would be a starting point. But clearly this, uh, this, uh, the, the succeeding governments uh, have not taken any position. Uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif uh, felt uh, very clearly that uh, the Lahore Declaration should be the basis of, uh, of uh, discussion between India and Pakistan. So there is, this, uh, uh, there is of course, a mechanism uh, what, what we, we call the composite dialogue. Uh, the Indians now talk about comprehensive dialogue, but clearly it's not getting anywhere. Now there are really three uh, 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 sort of uh, options that we have. Uh, you either take the multilateral route, but clearly India is not interested in that. Uh, India emphasizes uh, bilateral uh, uh, negotiations or discussions, but uh, uh, has, in a way, implied by the position that it has taken, that the talks will be on their terms. So I don't know how, how we can uh, progress uh, in terms of uh, any further movement between India and Pakistan. And thirdly, of course, mediation. But that again, uh, President Trump uh, has uh, talked about, the Americans have talked about uh, facilitating uh, things, but uh, as of now, there is no evidence uh, that Americans are making any serious effort, and uh, um, uh, and India has outrightly rejected that. So we are in a in a kind of a stalemated situation. Uh, uh, no progress on on any of the major issues between India and Pakistan. Uh, uh, yes, India has a, has a, has a, a major concern about terrorism. Uh, they talk about Bombay, they talk about Pathan Court, they talk about Uri. Uh, uh, certainly Pakistan has taken certain measures. Uh, but terrorism is, uh, is an issue which affects us as well, it affects Afghanistan. So th while there is a lot of uh, uh, talk about it, but in, in concrete terms, I, I don't think there has been really much uh, movement. We ourselves have faced a huge problem in Pakistan. Uh, we've had these military operations in uh, North Waziristan, South Waziristan, and of course some in Balochistan. But clearly there are now indications that things are, are also now uh, happening. Uh, there is some talk about uh, resurgence of the Taliban in, in South Waziristan. So this should really be a matter of grave concern to Pakistan. Our relation with Iran. Um, one of the countries that I certainly advocate that we should have better relations. Um, uh, Iranians are not easy uh, uh, people to deal with. Uh, uh, certainly our experience has been that they are uh, very tough negotiators as, as they have actually proved in the, in the nuclear talks with the Western countries. 
they are brilliant uh, negotiators. But I think as things are evolving in this region, as things are evolving in, uh, in Asia, especially this, uh, uh, the prospects of a great game uh, between the United States and China and, uh, and of course Russia, and the new formation of new uh, fr friendships and alliances, etc. Uh, for us, Pakistan, for, for, for Pakistan, Iran would be very critical as a, as a friend and as a, as a neighbor. And, I'm, and more importantly, in my opinion, uh, Iran is a major player in Afghanistan and it cannot be ignored. Even if the Americans don't like it, uh, they are a major player. So we have uh, our plate full. Uh, in my opinion, these are the real issues that we are facing at the moment. There is also uh, uh, the question of uh, Pakistan's friendship with China. This is becoming, a, uh, becoming an issue in the sense that uh, not the bilateral aspect, but of course, uh, Pakistan's uh, involvement in CPAC, uh, which is uh, of uh, very great importance to both Pakistan and to China. And it is part of the, uh, the One Belt, One Road project, uh, which is a, a very important geostrategic and geoeconomic initiative of the Chinese. Um, the, the Indians have clearly come out in opposition uh, of this thing, and uh, the Americans have made some odd statements. Uh, but if the position is not clear, where exactly the United States stands in regard to, to CPAC. So, uh, most of the problems that Pakistan is facing, frankly, these are major challenges, and of course, there are limited opportunities. There has been talk about Pakistan's growing relations with Russia. Uh, of course, it's uh, very welcome, uh, and the Russians are, uh, are a very important uh, player in Asia. Uh, they are uh, the second most powerful country in the world even today in terms of uh, military strength and uh, they, they, they certainly uh, could play a role in Asia and st to stabilize uh, uh, the situation. But uh, now, what in, in, in regard to Afghanistan, it's, it's uh, not, not, not only that uh, you know, Pakistan is being blamed uh, and um, I again refer to my good friend David Jabbar's uh, uh, very uh, an excellent article on uh, on uh, his response to the speech uh, that President uh, uh, President um, Trump made. Um, in Afghanistan, there are new players. Uh, Russia is now taking great interest. Uh, Iran is taking great interest. China is is taking interest, but they are a little a little coy. Uh, they don't want to uh, burn their fingers. Uh, and uh, and in the ultimate analysis, Pakistan has become the focus of uh, of uh, of the of the region. And the United States, I think, crossed the line. Uh, diplomatically, it was uh, it was uh, really unacceptable. <laughs> The president, that the president of the United States should have uh, insulted Pakistan uh, uh, by his uh, by the remarks that he made, by warning and threatening uh, the country. But you know, the United States is a superpower; it's everybody's neighbor. We have no choice but to have a relationship with uh, with the United States. So, you know, the option for Pakistan is not to confront the United States. Uh, but to act with uh, with, uh, with dignity, to act with uh, with uh, restraint, and uh, uh, also to engage in, in in a dialogue and to see if things can move forward. Uh, the Tilson visit, recent uh, visit of the Secretary of State, I don't think was uh, really resulted in anything significant, uh, other than the fact that he he uh, shall we say reiterated the warning uh, to Pakistan that if Pakistan were, is not going to act uh, in restraining uh, not only the Taliban but other uh, groups, uh, the United States will find its own way of uh, dealing with the situation. Now, I think one of the, one of the 
important aspects of this particular threat is that the United States has clubbed Taliban, the Haqqani group, and the so-called non-state non actors uh, who are supposed to be active vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis India. This, uh, I think, is a very serious matter, and I think uh, we, we, we cannot ignore it. Uh, I think the United States is emphasizing the Taliban and the, the uh, Haqqani element, but at the same time they are giving, in my judgment, equal importance to the, uh, you know, uh, the three or four groups uh, that are supposed to be active against uh, India. So we are in a, in a difficult situation and uh, I, I see really very few options uh, for Pakistan in regard to uh, the relationship with India for the time being. Uh, in the past, um, there have been uh, occasions when uh, India and Pakistan have talked of various other proposals, uh, like for instance, even the no-war pact. Uh, it was uh, it was Jawaharlal Nehru who offered it in 1948, and subsequently, I think eight or nine occasions, it was uh, uh, the uh, the proposal was put on the table by either India or Pakistan. It drafts are exchanged, uh, discussions uh, did take place, but in the ultimate analysis, nothing really happened. Now, I, in my judgment, um, uh, you know, India is a very it's a very big power, there's no doubt about it. It's a nuclear power, it's, a, it's got a second largest army in the world, a third largest uh, or fourth largest uh, air force in the world. It's um, got a huge navy, it's got great ambitions, uh, it's got a huge uh, arms acquisition program. Uh, so all this is actually very worrisome for Pakistan because uh, if the conventional gap between India and Pakistan grows, um, uh, frankly, uh, the Indian would in a way be driving Pakistan as a nu nuclear threshold, which is uh, which I'm not I'm not I'm not a person who favors war or, or favors uh, a nuclear war, uh, but I think these the conventional gap between India and Pakistan eventually is going to get alarming. But more important than that is that India has got a very um, well, an economy that is really growing, uh, the gap in the economy is also growing between India and Pakistan, and one important factor, India is fast becoming a knowledge-based society, which is where we, frankly, uh, have not made much progress. And this, again, this is really the responsibility of the government, the state. Um, uh, as I said earlier in my remarks, uh, that um, uh, really, as far as uh, our, our internal situation is concerned, this should also be of great concern to Pakistan, Pakistanis, to all Pakistanis who, who value uh, stability, progress, and development uh, in the country. Uh, we are really at sea. We don't know what's happening. Uh, there is a third-rate soap opera going on in, uh, in Islamabad, and we really don't know which way it's going to end. So uh, I would like really conclude my remarks here uh, by saying that uh, while uh, we should continue to uh, to uh, to seek uh, dialogue with India, but we don't have to beg for a dialogue. I think this is the responsibility of both countries, India and Pakistan, uh, to seek uh, because peace and stability will only come in the region uh, if our uh, problems are resolved, we are ready to talk about it. Uh, I'm in no position to say what our government is thinking at the moment. I am not so sure there is much thinking going on. Uh, so, uh, so it's difficult to uh, anticipate what this government or the next government is, uh, is likely to, to do in regard to relations with India. Sadly, our relations in South Asia also with Bangladesh uh, have suffered. Uh, of uh, of late, uh, and uh, that's really mainly because of the attitude of uh, the Awami League government, and particularly Sina Wajid. I know her personally. Uh, I know she has a personal animus about Pakistan. She 
in her, in, in deep down in her heart, she thinks that Pakistan uh, was somewhat responsible for the assassination of, uh, of her father and her family. So that animus has really been, uh, has been, uh, been surfacing and our relations have uh, really deteriorated. Um, and uh, this is sad because uh, I think this is the uh, one area where uh, Pakistan's relations with Nepal are very good, uh, with Bhutan uh, and other countries, Sri Lanka and Maldives. But uh, with Bangladesh, the deterioration is, is, uh, is one of concern. As far as regional connectivity is concerned, uh, SARC. Now, SARC in my opinion is an intensive care unit and really uh, I don't see uh, a revival taking place because I think India is probably no longer interested in, in moving forward on SARC uh, because they, they, are also, they are also mixing up their, their uh, trading relations with Pakistan in the context of continuity, connective, connectivity and and, uh, and uh, regional uh, development. It would be ideal if India and Pakistan and the other eight, I mean all the eight SAC countries were, were able to move forward. Um, but you can only move forward if you, if you uh, are serious. And it seems to us that India went out of its way to sabotage the SAC summit uh, last year. And uh, there is evidence that India was the first country to cancel it. Uh, to, uh, to, to, to raise objections and within four or five minutes a telegram from Bhutan and Maldives and Nepal uh, started arriving in the SARC secretariat. So you can see that uh, India had a mischievous hand in, in that. Now in regard to the great power relationships, Pakistan's relations with China are flawless, uh, they are wrinkle free. Uh, and clearly, China is a, is a friend, and, and we hope that uh, uh, CPAC uh, moves forward the way we envisage it. But here, uh, I, I just want to say that the Ch I know that the Chinese are very serious. Uh, uh, your, my own, own encounter with some of the senior Chinese people, they are serious, they want uh, to move forward. Uh, they do have some concerns about Pakistan. Factors are really the security uh, and also capacity and capability of dealing with these kind of huge projects. So um, uh, clearly, the attitude of India and the United States would be a matter of concern. But there are many countries in the in in, in the adjacent regions that are interested in in, uh, in seeing that uh, CPAC uh, makes progress. Uh, I think. Uh, if you, uh, Dr. Masuma, if it's all right, I'll stop here and I'll invite um, Ambassador Ali uh, Sarwar Nakwi to, to come and, uh, or would you like to speak from there? We can come here. I am going to look at another as another part of another way of, of not another way but an, an additional perspective of interstate conflicts and how to, uh, how to settle them. Uh, interstate conflicts uh, go back to the time when the state system came into existence. In fact, even before the state system, there were inter-monarchy conflicts and inter-tribe conflicts and whatever have you. So this has been a perennial problem of humankind ever since history has been recorded. Uh, war has preoccupied the minds of people from the time of the Congress of Vienna in 1815. And it was the first international gathering which decided to take measures 
to prevent interstate conflicts and to uh, contain them if they take place. Uh, but then there were problems which eventually led to the First World War. I'll give you a very quick uh, survey of this, uh, which eventually led to the First World War. And the first, after the First World War, the League of Nations was created. The League of Nations was an international uh, system that was devised to outlaw war. The League of Nations outlawed war. But that didn't work. That didn't work. The Italy conquered uh, Ethiopia, Japan invaded Manchuria, and the League of Nations collapsed. Then came the Second World War, and the Second World War, uh, learning from the lesson of the League of Nations, did not outlaw war, but it tried to regulate war. So, under the UN Charter, chapters uh, 6 and 7, are aimed at preventing conflicts and preventing the outbreak of war. And it created the Security Council, which was made responsible and mandated uh, to uh, implement the UN Charter. Uh, but then, the Security Council was virtually put out of action by the Cold War and the polarization of the world um, uh, between communist and non-communist uh, uh, countries. Uh, Kashmir and Palestine are two issues which were victims of the Cold War. Because if the Cold War had not taken shape as it did, Kashmir uh, was, as Riyaz said, was, was a, a problem that was active in the 50s and could well have been resolved. But many a times, resolutions of Kashmir were vetoed by the then Soviet Union. And uh, the result was a Kashmir issue never got resolved. And so, did the Palestinian issue suffer from inaction. So, this being the background, the international system is aimed at containing conflicts and, and also establishing a judicial system called the ICJ uh, for the International Court of Justice for arbitrating or adjudicating between countries in, uh, in regard to their disputes. Uh, now, the ICJ unfortunately has only advisory role. It, it, it's not like national court systems where it gives a ruling which is then mandatory for the parties to accept. Uh, the, the ICJ has an advisory role only. So this is the broad international framework and then there are the regional frameworks like the European Union and to some extent uh, some of the Warsaw Pact and other uh, groupings that were formed. The ASEAN and SARC deliberately are non-political. So they can only talk about economic matters and not about political matters. Finally, there is the bilateral level of resolving or settling interstate conflicts. This is what India wants, as Rayal explained, to do with Pakistan. But the unfortunate thing is that the Indians are never willing to talk with the result that there is no bilateral uh, uh, interaction. So, in settling interstate conflicts <coughs> remain, remains a problem that is virtually intractable and nothing can really be achieved. Uh, uh, political disputes cannot be settled. There have been some uh, situations in, in Latin America uh, uh, under the, uh, their, their uh, institutional framework and in Africa under the African Union that some small dis disputes have been settled 
uh, between the less important countries. But when it comes to bigger issues or bigger countries, uh, they remain unsettled. So uh, I thought I'll just give you a broad perspective of uh, settling interstate conflicts and how the world deals with it. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your remarks. I will now uh, call Dr. Fazana Sheikh to please come. Days I was sort of positioned in, in that corner uh, looking up at the title of this conference, um, which, uh, of course, as, as you know, was uh, titled Peace in South Asia uh, Opportunities and Challenges. And I sat there and I said, Well, next time around, if I'm ever asked for, for my opinion, I will say we should have peace in South Asia, missed opportunities, and enduring challenges because there have really been many missed opportunities for peace on all sides. Uh, and I think you know, those have not been fully uh, taken on board. And uh, I'm afraid the challenges over the last 70 years have remained as, as permanent and enduring and have arguably become even more difficult um, uh, with, with the passage of time. Um, I'm going to start off by, by taking a slightly unorthodox uh, and possibly even controversial view, not with a view to, 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 to generating uh, a polemical discussion. Perhaps we need to take on board, and certainly as a historian, I've been very aware of this, and that is that the Kashmir dispute, unlike, say, Palestine, with which it is repeatedly uh, compared, is not just uh, a dispute over territory. It's not just a territorial dispute. It is fundamentally, to my mind, a dispute over over uh, questions of identity, of, of two competing uh, views of nationalism uh, and, uh, and, and the nation. India, which feels that it must cling on to Kashmir, because not to do so would seriously compromise its the, the secular basis of, 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 of the Indian nation state. And Pakistan, of course, for its part, has always believed that as the homeland for Muslims, to let go of this significant uh, population of Muslims would in some sense erode its own national identity. And I think that's really what makes this particular dispute so very difficult uh, and much less amenable, I think, than most other disputes uh, that, 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 that center on, on, on questions of, of, of territory. So uh, having said that, uh, I would just move on to uh, uh, you know, one of the other issues that, that came up, and that is Pakistan's relations with its immediate neighbors. And I think certainly the view from abroad, which is which is where I live, although I, I come back to, to Pakistan twice, if not three times a year, the view from abroad, uh, and it's one that I share partially with much regret, 
is that 70 years after independence, Pakistan has such few friends in the region. I mean, I'm going to set aside Pakistan's relations with India for the time being, but there was no reason for our relations with Afghanistan to have deteriorated as drastically that they have. And particularly when you think that, you know, in, in very recent years, and here I, you know, have this missed opportunity uh, uh, term in mind, when uh, President Ashraf Ghani uh, came to Pakistan uh, making his first foreign trip abroad upon assuming power as president, he reached out to Pakistan and I don't think we responded with the kind of, um, we, didn't, we didn't welcome him and didn't respond in the way that I think we could have to really uh, be able to move uh, this, this relationship uh, forward. So Pakistan of course finds itself curiously saddled today, 70 years after independence, in a position which in fact I think its entire foreign and security policies over the last 70 years have tried to avoid. That is being a yam between two storms, India and Afghanistan. And what do we find 70 years later? We find Pakistan in the middle with two hostile neighbors on either side. It doesn't bode well for us. Our relations with Iran, as uh, Riyad Saab said, have, you know, are, 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 are tense uh, at the best of times. Our relations with Bangladesh, you know, are, have, have, you know, had no good reason to deteriorate the way they have. They are not good. Across Central Asia, and I meet quite a few people coming from Central Asia, there is deep suspicion and hostility towards Pakistan. And as a Pakistani, I'm amazed by the fundamental paradox of our country, which is known for its incredible hospitality. I mean, everybody talks about the way you are received in Pakistan. And yet, there is so much hostility towards us. I mean, you just can't square that circle. And I think this is something that, that foreign policy uh, experts need to think much harder about. Um, I want to say one last thing about um, our relations with China, about which we've also heard a great deal. And I, you know, really what I want to, to bring out here is that, of course, at this point in time, you know, we are uh, very well, publicly grateful for China to, to you know, for, for helping us out of our economic predicament in, in, in all sectors, particularly all sectors of, of the economy. Uh, but also, let's, let's, be, let's be open about it for, for uh, you know, giving us the kind of clout we need to, 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 to face uh, the, the threat from India. My concern, and I think the concern of many others, with whether it is about uh, you know, the larger question of our ever deepening relationship with China and particularly CPEC, is uh, you know, whether, it, whether Pakistan can really afford to be so closely bracketed with China. It is being bracketed with China at a time when, as we have heard again, Riaz Kukar Saab mentioning and talking about a real great game being played out uh, in the South Asian region between, uh, between the United States, between India, between Afghanistan. Pakistan does not have the resources, the capability uh, to, 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 to get involved uh, in this great game, which I fear it might uh, risk getting involved in precisely because of being so closely uh, bracketed uh, with with China. In other words, I think what I'm trying to say is that uh, there is a risk here that our involvement in China's great geoeconomic project might draw us into China's bigger geopolitical game. And we've already, as we've heard over the last couple of days, had our fingers badly burnt. And I think, you know, we need to think about this again. There needs to be more transparency, more openness about Pakistan's relations with China. Riaz Bokir Saab and Sarban Afi Saab talked about China's concerns about Pakistan. There are some, but Pakistan must surely have some concerns about China. 
some reservations about uh, the trajectory of this relationship and what it will spell for future generations uh, of, uh, of Pakistanis. But I'd like to end here with just one final observation, again getting back to the one question that has dominated uh, the discussion over the last couple of days, and that is, uh, of course, our relations with India over Kashmir. And we've heard again about Pakistan's population problem. And while I, like many of you in this room and across the country, believe that the, 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 cause, the, the, the cause of Kashmir is a just cause, I do not believe that Pakistan... Uh, there is always a surprise and uh, like everyone else, uh, I am really deeply appreciated and grateful to Dr. Masum Hassan for not only uh, bringing this group together but also giving uh, us an opportunity to share uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, think through some of our uh, remarks. I have extensive notes that I made uh, but what I would like to sort of point out are two things. Uh, since uh, yesterday, I have not seen sun. People have been sitting here so engaged. Uh, I have not been able to go out. When I came from Bahar, Bahar was smoggy. And I am told uh, the, the air is clearing up. But here it is quite intense. So uh, it is, it is uh, uh, really uh, very, very interesting uh, for, the, for, the, for the last uh, uh, two days. I, I must say, uh, uh, you know, I have heard some very uh, insightful, deceptive, and uh, informative and equally provocative uh, uh, presentations uh, by, by uh, some of these speakers, uh, in particular from the uh, retired diplomats and also for the generals. Uh, I get envious uh, because they have so much of information to share uh, once they're out of job and then, uh, or, or the, you know, they get a new life and new job. But when they're in service, it's equally awesome to really talk to them because uh, it, is, it, it is tough. And I can say this with some hindsight and experience because for 15 years I had the opportunity of training the civil service of Pakistan and the civil services academy and therefore uh, I could not imagine which I, what, what I see today that when I started the, uh, at the civil services academy in late 1988, it was 15th common. And had somebody asked me, will you see 15th common in power? Uh, I would have said, no, I have no idea. And lo and behold, they are right on top. So, you know, this is how uh, this, this uh, sort of uh, uh, changes and, 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 and uh, these changes have to be understood uh, in, in, in that context. So, uh, where do I start? Uh, I, I would like to make a few uh, observations with reference to challenges. Uh, number one, uh, it has been pointed out uh, by repeated speakers uh, uh, that conflict in some ways continues to be a way of life in South Asia. Dispute, contestation is a way of life. Uh, if that is the case, and uh, that uh, offers a very grim uh, kind of a situation, and hearing it from people who have had the experience of negotiation and going uh, over and over again, and at the same time, uh, sort of coming up with the notion that we are willing. Look, over a period of time, we have changed. The other side is not changing. It is hard to sort of uh, believe uh, when you hear this. But we do want to believe it because they have uh, the knowledge and experience and uh, therefore one would like to really uh, raise this. So on this, uh, what I would like to sort of raise with you is that if conflict is innate to South Asia, disputes are intractable, is there a way or a possibility that you can think in terms of changing the culture of diplomacy? Is there a way that you can think in terms of expanding the base of those who are inter interlocutors? If you look at the interlocutors and the knowledge base, you are surprised that if I was in Islamabad, Lahore, uh, and Karachi, I am likely to hear these 25 or 30 persons, nothing more, nothing less, and more or less the same kind of uh, uh, emphasis is, is really laid out. So, in, in some ways, uh, there is, and it, it's the same kind of situation when you are in a, a, in a scene with the Indians and others. That there is a similar kind of experience. They will talk in terms of uh, dignity, pride, and very great degree of politeness with each other. Can we really think in terms of changing the mindset and changing the styles of negotiation with the kind of entrenched 
thinking that we have, there is no possibility that under these circumstances you can really uh, move in a direction of a possible change. So that's one part which is very difficult and, and therefore difficult to understand. The second, which is again uh, repeatedly pointed out, and I'm rehashing in some ways, uh, is, 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 a, is a situation where the credibility of our leadership and policy makers, be it Eku Khan, or be it General Musharraf, or be it Mr. Nawaz Sharif, the credibility of leadership is a reflection of state's credibility. Therefore, if your leadership is not credible, or conveys the impression of lack of seriousness of purpose, you have a serious uh, crisis. And therefore, it is very, very difficult to respond to. And this translates into a challenge when you go outside. That if your leadership is not credible, how should I trust this state? And, and therefore, it is very difficult. And uh, uh, Yas Fulker rightly pointed out, uh, with reference to Iranians, uh, and I've seen it personally as, as somebody who was teaching at Columbia for some time, that they are very deft, skillful, tough negotiators, and they think these things through. And they have a sense of consciousness about being able to take pride in their civilization. So when we talk of Iran, Iran evokes very much like China, the memory of history. And they also <coughs> may not say it, but like uh, President Xi, uh, they would also say socialism with Chinese characteristics, Islam with Iranian characteristics. And that's the kind of message uh, that one has to sort of really understand. So if you're really looking at it, the critical question that I, I, I would like to raise again uh, here is, uh, you know, what really made us change our mind to uh, let Iranians uh, speak to us. When you look at the previous chief, uh, he did not go to Iran. This chief was received by the Iranian <coughs> president. Where is the foreign minister? Others, you know, you have to ask this fundamental question. When people say that it is the security establishment, well, it appears to me that unfortunately, whether I like it or not, I may be very critical. From the outside perspective, the only credible leadership, decision maker, is the man in uniform. And therefore, you prefer to negotiate with them rather than with the civilians. Hence, this imbalance which is created, perpetuated from outside also because you offer a sense of legitimacy. And here, since I am on this point, I do want to make, make it very emphatically clear that look at the last chief of Pakistan army. How many army chiefs have been received in 10 Downing Street? Who gave us the legitimacy that you know you can be received as an army chief? So, so if you're trying to understand why army is a 10-pound gorilla in a, in, in, in a room, one has to understand that this legitimacy is coming not from within, but also from outside. So therefore, one has to really raise this. So, so here, the critical question that I'm raising is, that I would like to have a better appreciation and understanding that given the Iranian-Saudi rivalry, which we have not uh, spoken yet, what made Pakistan really, uh, or Pakistan military, uh, really rethink that it is about time that we need to really engage with Iran. Uh, and uh, uh, you have, again, uh, very rightly, Ras uh, Kukas uh, uh, has pointed out, Iran is a very important significant player in Afghanistan, and for a long time it has been, but we have tried to look the other way around. So what is it that has dawned upon us, and therefore one needs to really uh, look, look at this a little more carefully. Uh, third point that I, since, uh, since I want to stay with the contemporary and want to look at the future part, the third point that I want to raise, and I do want to, uh, to sort of see some reaction on it, I tend to see that on Pakistan, US and Chinese interests converge despite serious differences. Uh, despite serious differences, the Chinese and American interests converge. And you can go back to 1971, and you can also go back to 1976. Mr. Bhutto was the last prime minister of any outside country to meet Mao Zedong, which is again very, very significant, and one needs to sort of have some understanding of it. Then Xiaoping in 78 starts the kind of change that takes place. But they have not really 
shaken the foundations of Chinese continuity in policies and thinking which happened in case of Russia. So therefore, you have to really think this through, that when Chinese are coming with a project, if they launched it in 2013, Belt and Road and said, I have worked on this, they had probably spent more than five to seven years in really thinking this through and really coming out with it. And by the time they have come out, we were caught with surprise. We are still not very serious about it. We are still very, very concerned uh, and, and would like to raise, as has been pointed out so many times, that, uh, uh, that uh, I, I, I may, uh, you know, sort of want you to think that, as focus up said, China-Pakistan relationship is flawless. I'm afraid no relationship is flawless. Even a very good love affair or a marriage is also not flawless. I'm sorry. But that's how uh, it is. So therefore, one has to really see. And as, as, as I look at it, you see there are, there are a number of issues which one need to really examine very carefully. Yes, Chinese have strategic, economic, cultural, educational, and people to people interest. And when you look at this CPAC and B and R, you know, these are the components which are emphasized. And they go back and emphasize the punch solar business, non-interference. But now, the critical question that is emerging is, will China be able to you know, stay and pursue non-interference? Or will China, as you rightly pointed out, in case of, uh, 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 you know, in case of uh, Middle East, in case of Afghanistan, will it be forced to really play a role which it is going to play reluctantly. And, and the last point that I, I, I want to make is not with reference to, 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 to Pakistan. Uh, in fact, two four points, if you may permit me. Two points. One is that I really want to see, uh, you know, for example, look at this halal meat business. If we were to join hands with China, you know, we can really dominate not only uh, Middle East, but I can go many places. You know, just think of halal meat, nothing else. Uh, if you were to, uh, and, and they are biggest consumers, they are also exporters. I mean, they are in the kind of first two up. It is on beef. That's a, that's a problem that one has to be really, uh, sort, sort of think through. But, uh, and, and there, uh, this is the fourth and a relatively controversial point that I want to raise. India is the most vulnerable naval power in South Asia. It is not in a position to defend the borders that it has. With CPAC, with BNR, what we are likely to see happen is that in the coming five years, and I don't want to go beyond that because this is where, where I see myself, and in the coming five years, I would see a revival of Pakistan Navy, refurbishing of Pakistan Navy. We will begin to, or we will begin to ask ourselves, can we have, or do we have a maritime strategy? If we don't, uh, the others are going to have it, and therefore you will have to uh, sort of become an appendix as you are becoming an appendix, as as you as you see like I said. So, so if if you really look at that, in that context, this area which is Persian Gulf and beyond, and if I were to sort of uh, uh, suggest one liner, whosoever is going to dominate the Arabian Sea is going to dominate the Gulf and the Indian Ocean, and whosoever is going to do this is likely to get into the Pacific and that is where China is. You have to think of this Gavada business down to Malacca Strait and you have to keep asking yourself that CPAC has four components. One is infrastructure which army is serious and will take care of it. Second is economic zones which we are not interested because we have not done anything on Karakoram Highway. And third is energy where again the Chinese are more than willing because they say we are going to take care of our pollution. If you want to have pollution, it's your problem. We are going to give you coal plants and assets that, that, that you need. And finally, is the issue of Gawadar. And when you think of Gawadar, you think of Gawadar, Charba, Salana, and also Djibouti. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor. Yes, just for the record, the difference between the way the Chinese are dealing with us and the way the Americans dealt with us. There is a vast difference. They have never pushed us on, on any major issue, but look at the way the Americans have treated us. Uh, the recent example, and of course there are many other examples, where, where our, uh, our leaders have been instructed by the Americans in private conversations. 
The Chinese have never done it. They've done always emphasized two things. Please develop yourself, number one. That has always been the Chinese advice, right from Chairman Mao's time. Uh, I'm a witness to this thing, so I can, I can underline that. Secondly, yeah, and secondly, uh, the, the Chinese are also been emphasizing Pakistan should try and improve its relations with neighbors and also with neighbors. This has always been their advice. So the Chinese are, are, are you know, far more, far more mature uh, than the Americans have been. Uh, I would now request... No, uh, to correct, uh, and you different answer correctly. Uh, I teach at SOAS, uh, I'm a political economist. I, I'm, I'm introducing myself mostly because most of you will not know my work. Uh, I work on regional cooperation and economic issues in, in Asia uh, generally. And so it's, it's hard for me to, at, at this stage of the, of the evening, to say anything new that hasn't been said. Uh, so I'm going to go with the alternatives to say provocative things and hopefully you know, wake you up a little bit and then I try to get you uh, earth uh, and, and before we have the, the concluding session. Um, generally, I, I disagree completely with the uh, characterization of, of SARC. SARC uh, uh, you know, has not functioned on account is that it was set up not to function. It was you know, on the basis of unanimity uh, that you could not discuss, uh, in the charter it, it specifies that you could not discuss controversial issues, so therefore it sets itself for failure. I wrote a book about it and tried to actually find something that SARC has done over the last, you know, not much, 20, 28 years. Uh, and I did find something, uh, maybe two things. The first thing is that there was uh, the South Asia Free Trade Agreement, I think it's an achievement uh, that, that has been uh, uh, enacted through through the uh, forum of SAR, and I think that's quite optimistic. Uh, as I'm, uh, I'm intri intrigued by the idea of increased trade in South Asia, uh, but there are specific uh, structural impediments for doing so. Uh, namely, because the, the reason that there's no increase in trade between South Asian nations is not necessarily because the governments don't like each other, it's because there's little trade congress between different countries. So generally, if Pakistan wants to trade with India, it has really little to offer India in exchange uh, because, uh, of the, because most of the of the of Pakistani exports are in textiles. India is not going to purchase textiles, and so it's most likely to, to sell them in, in Europe, for instance. And, and so, that, so there's a there's a, an issue that the that the products that Pakistan produces have little demand elsewhere in South Asia, and Bangladesh has the same problem with, with India. So this is the reason why there's little trade. Um, generally, th there will be an increase in trade if there are better relations, and there's a expectation that whenever there's increase in trade uh, between nations, that there's a potential for, for peace and stability. But given the circumstances, I would not look at trade as a potential uh, savior for, for, uh, for, for, uh, for South Asia. I wouldn't look at CPEC or any uh, involvement by China in any part of South Asia either. If you were to look outside of South Asia, namely if you were to look uh, towards Africa, the relationship of China with African, specific African countries has not been very pretty. And I just anticipate that Pakistan will, will find itself in a very tough situation within the next decade, or if not sooner. So I think that if you're interested in, 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 in that outlet uh, as a resource for peace, I think there's uh, a lot of wishful thinking uh, on many of those parts. So where do we go from here? Uh, generally, uh, I'm a pessimist. Uh, I have been rarely proven wrong on account of my pessimism, and I think that uh, uh, hopefully, I mean, I wish I would be proven wrong on, 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 on the issues of trade and stability, or on account of CPEC or Chinese involvement in, in, the, in the region, but I'm not a pes optimistic on that account. I am optimistic, however, on one thing, and that is that there is a potential, in fact, there's an actual nation, uh, I'm, I'm going to call it South, South, uh, South Asian uh, it's a country that doesn't really, you can't find it on the map, where people from South Asia are able to be, live peacefully, cooperate with each other, engage with each other, and we were talking about that yesterday, namely 37, 38 million uh, expats who, who are working in the Gulf. They work in hotels and the taxi industry and all, at all levels of, of, of the service economy, and they're able to cooperate in that sense. Why is that the case? Namely, because there's no involvement by government. They're there on their own account, and they're, don't, the, the differences that, that separate people and governments are not visible there. They, they will eat with people who, are, who are, they view as their brothers regionally, 
and therefore is the, is the, the government that is the one that is causing problems with peace. Um, unfortunately, South Asia has been cursed with bad governments and bad governance. In some countries, it's an issue of corruption and corrupt politicians. In other countries, it's an issue of the monarchy. In another country, in South Asia, it's an issue of having a majority trying to oppress a minority. Maybe it could be more than one. And in, in, in one country, the country that I'm now, I believe strongly that it is the military that has been a, a toxic impact on the political system and the economic impact that it has on development. And so therefore, on account of that, I, not, I think that if you want peace, you have to get rid of governments. I'll end up with that. No, thank you. There's an underlying subtle assumption that we are not at war presently. Most of the discussion alludes to the remote possibility of war, and therefore an attempt to dissect how peace is to be achieved. I think we are at war. We are at war with ourselves. We are at war with our neighbors. We are at war with our prospective or present enemies. We are an enemy-driven society, despite being very hospitable, as Farzana Sheikh just said. I'd like to mention two quotes from Nelson Mandela. I happen to be an East and Southern Africa person. I don't do Pakistan, but I love to be uh, an audience. So I've been sprung with a surprise, so I'm hence here. There's a saying by Mandela that there is no peace without equality. If you want to make peace with your enemy, you have to work with your enemy then he becomes your partner. And the second quote is, no one is born with hate. They learn to hate. So if you can learn to hate, you can also learn to love. Because it comes naturally to the human heart. I have a few points because of shortage of time. And I just present these points for your esteemed reflection. And if you wish to discuss later, Koker Saab will be here to moderate. If we deeply reflect on the factors that may contribute to lack of peace, the following come to mind. Number one for me is a toxic concept of masculinity that permeates our society. An inbuilding of gender inequality within social constructs. Ignorance of lack of non-violent means of conflict resolution. Lack of knowledge and ignorance of the enemy. And the otherization of the other by propaganda. Distortion of truth and mistrust deep insecurity in the self-image of the population as well as its leaders, an overall inflated state apparatus, especially its armed forces, <coughs> poor education, prejudicial school syllabi, distorting and dehumanizing the enemy, militarization of a society, willfully converting a social welfare state into a national security state. Deliberate, or deliberate allocation of economic resources towards threatening an enemy, rather than using the same resources to making society economically self-reliant, secure, prosperous, and happy thwarting trade or any human contact with the enemy, tribalism as a catalyst of patriarchal values. Here's a very important point. Using religion to promote war than to promote peace. Using religion to exclude, not include women as contributors of peace. Using religion to protect 
not to uh, religion to oppress, not to protect minorities. The role of intelligentsia of a society is very important. And the role of intelligentsia in overemphasizing conflict, war, and de-emphasizing peace. These are the points I've been mulling about because our great host, Dr. Masuma, asked me, sprung this uh, thing on me, so I was just mulling over it. And this is a very important and last point that I'd like. I had wished that there was a demog demographer amongst us because, you know, they did experiments, lab experiments on mice once in which they kept putting more and more mice in a box and the mice start tearing each other. So exponential population explosion which Pakistan is a victim of, the crowding of places, the destruction of land mass ratio. If we deeply reflect on these points, these are very important points and we really need to introspect. I would like to thank the Institute, our esteemed host, Dr. Masuma Hassan, the researchers, support staff, the entire this very important conference with such professionalism patience and love. The way I was treated, I'm so honored, I'm so grateful. I mean, they chased me, they found me, they gave me my ticket, they got me over, they got me the car. I'm so grateful to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the points you raised are uh, very, very important. But perhaps of the points you require a separate seminar. So they're all so critical. Uh, three questions. Three questions, one from this side, one from this side, and one from that. Okay, you go first. Please uh, just ask a question. And thank you, Dr. Masana, for giving our students this opportunity uh, to learn. Um, Mr. Said, he pointed out CPAC as a maritime, or hinted to it, CPAC being a maritime, expect a, a maritime kind of influence or something. Whether it's economic or military is a different argument. But I would like to ask, what CPEC, what is, is CPEC going to act as a centripetal or centrifugal force in Pakistan? And what does it mean for the Baloch people? Is it going to act as a centripetal or centrifugal force in Pakistan? Thank you. Uh, yeah, now it's working. Okay. Uh, uh, first, first uh, thank you so much for the question. Uh, one, Pakistan's future lies in Baluchistan. Not in the territorial sense of the term that it is 40% of Pakistan, but in the cultural, social, political terms, in terms of really uh, providing the right of representation, protecting rights, and uh, you know taking care of resources, and, and more importantly, producing a sense of justice. So that is the most important part. It is in that sense, I say, Pakistan's future lies in Pakistan. And Pakistan is going to be an area of contestation, both uh, from the Afghan, Pakistan, uh, Iran uh, uh, perspective on one side. So the way we have to be very, very uh, careful, cautious, and prudent in, in really dealing with this. Thank you. Right? Okay, I'll stop. Uh, I just want to just want to add to what he said. Uh, of course, this is very important. What he, his response was very important. But there's also, by the way, a motivated campaign uh, in in Pakistan against CPAC. So please keep that factor in mind. Also, you can see from the quality of articles that have come out, and you can clearly see some uh, some kind of uh, uh, you know encouragement to write those kind of articles. So please ask your question only. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Mustafa Purwala. I would like to refer a very, very interesting part. You see, please pointed out please that please there was brief. Brief. Ask us. Pointed out about the law of his, and similarly, I would like to say that quoting a very small examples like football, like hockey, and like cricket, these are the significant places where one can see how relation can be built. Relation between Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, Iran are but obvious. Without the relation, we cannot exist. Talking about the CPEC, 